Hello everyone. Welcome to the next video of ALD Labs. In the previous video, we discussed about uh, implementing the F50 application, 8.50 application on the ARM processor. Uh, we are going to discuss few more aspects of the SDK. Uh, we are going to discuss how to do the debugging in detail. Then we are also going to discuss how to do the execution time calculation. And then we are going to discuss how to make use of the inbuilt, uh, the optimization, code optimization features of the SDK. So we'll start from the scratch. So and this is the uh, project which I have exported from the uh, Vivado. The project is same as the previous lab. Then I'll start with the uh, basic project. A50, 8.50. I'll use the same hardware platform which I have exported Cortex uh, Core 0 processor, C code, and I'll create the PSP. So let's start the hello world as our um, um, basic starting point. So here you will see that the uh, few couple of files are generated. One is the board support package, and the second is your application project. Okay, so the project is uh, built with the basic hello world example. So you will see the two project folder. One is the BSP that is board support package. And in the BSP, you will see that the, all the necessary libraries are included. Uh, one of the important library you will see that uh, is the parameters, uh, uh, parameters storage. And then for every uh, unit which is available inside the processor, the corresponding drivers are there. For example, for the UART, the corresponding drivers are there in the uh, this uh, folder. Similarly, for there is a, a timer is there, a snoop control unit timer, the corresponding driver files are there, which we need to use it if you want to use the corresponding uh, driver. So similarly, in case of the CPU, also the corresponding uh, drivers and the details are already there. So in the here I'm looking for one file called as a X parameter dot H, which is very important file. So you can see that in the X parameter dot H, everything, all the information about the different units in the SOC are there. So if you are using any IP in the FPJ, the corresponding details will be there inside this X parameter. And X parameter PS means all the peripherals of the PS or the memory units, the corresponding address information is there in the X parameter dot uh, PS dot H. So these are the important files. Then uh, in the our main folder, you will see that you have the source folder in this hello world dot C. So initially the init perform uh, platform is done. So you can look at what is happening. It is nothing but the, it is doing the enable cache one, uh, processor cache. So you can see that this function is there, enable cache, and the appropriate uh, uh, un uh, cache enable function is done. If you are using microblaze, then corresponding enable for the microblaze is done. So here you can see that there is a separate cache for the instruction and separate cache for the data so that is taken care. And in the clean, it, clean platform, you will, you can go and see it in the clean platform, you disable the cache, okay? So this is, these are the things are taken care in the init and clap, uh, 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 clean platform. Then you have the print function. In the print function on the standard out, you display the data. So you can see that the, on the inside the uh, print function in the standard out base address, so we'll, uh, look at the base address. So this is the base address. And if you remember our lecture, this base address corresponds to the peripheral base address. So we'll look at what is this base address later, but you can see that uh, on that base address, it is writing the character by character. Okay, this is again being uh, done in the uh, print function. And uh, you can see that this uh, study out base address is assigned with this value and we will find out what is this base uh, value is. Okay, so now you can see that this base address correspond to this one. And if you uh, are following the lectures in the lecture, I showed you one slide where 
you know that this corresponds to the sum of the peripheral. This range corresponds to peripheral. So we'll go to the uh, BSP dot H, and if we go to the X parameter, uh, PS dot H, and then I'll search for this address. So let's search for this address. And you can see that this address corresponds to the UART. So basically, uh, in the print command, when you write print command, on this base address, this is the standard out base address, this corresponds to UART because we have enabled the UART. And then the, to that one, you are writing the, uh, sending the byte by byte, okay? So this is again, out byte is a function, which is nothing but the calling the uh, UART driver. And then at the UART driver, you are writing inside the inside the uh, UART buffer. Okay. So again, this is the UART driver. The corresponding drivers are written. Uh, you can see that this is I am writing it at the appropriate registers in the UART, and uh, this will uh, subsequently correspond to the either AXI or the APP transaction of the writer. So this is how we are making use of the, using the printf statement, you can see that subsequent calls are made to the appropriate UART driver. So this is the first thing you need to understand. You should be aware about how each function is being used inside the SDK and how it is connected to the driver. Now, uh, the next thing is that we will copy paste our uh, FFT code, which we have used in the previous lab for the 8.50. Uh, I have made some changes, so I'll discuss that uh, soon. So this is our code. So first process, first thing is that the build will be done automatically. So now uh, you can this see that as we discussed in the previous video, we are doing the 8.50. And in the 8.50, you have the three stages and you have the corresponding uh, twiddle for factors, which we have already used as a default uh, fixed constant values, okay, of the type float. Then uh, you can do is that, uh, what you do is that main function is the one which will be executed. So it will be a start, uh, first will be, it will be executed. So you define your input here. I'm defining as a input as a fixed input. You can take the input via UART also that you can modify the code. That's not an issue. And uh, in to calculate the FFT, there are two stages. One is that you reorder the input so that your output is in the normal order. And second is that you get the perform the FFT operation. So I'm using this uh, uh, vector to store the reorder output. Now I want to find out the execution time on the processor, like how many clock cycle or how much time it takes for the processor to perform the FFT. So what I'm going to use is that I'm going to include the, use the internal timer, which are there inside the uh, processor. Now inside the uh, processor, uh, PS in the Zinc SOC, there are multiple timers are there. As I told you, there is a SCU timer, there is a global timer, different timers are there. So for the today's lab, we will use this timer, which is defined in the X, time l dot h so if you open this timer you can see that this is the uh, timer it's a 64 bit timer it's a 64 bit counter okay then uh, this counter what is this counter at every clock cycle it will count increment the counter by one and it is ranges from 0 to 2 power 64 so it's a very large counter and it operates, so if you see that the, again, for every timer or counter, there is a base address. So base address is this one, and this will be de uh, defined in the X parameter PS dot H. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so if you go X parameter PS dot H, you can see that the there is a corresponding base address has been defined for this one. Then uh, you can see that there is an offset for the register, which you will uh, know more about it when we start using it. But what is more important is that this one operates at your, this is your CPU frequency divided by two. So it operates at half the CPU frequency. And if you remember my previous discussion, your CPU uh, operates at 666 megahertz. And if you are not sure about how it, uh, whether it is really operating at 664, six megahertz, just click on this open declaration, go here, then again, this is the one open declaration, and you can see that this is the 666 megahertz, experimenter.h. 
Okay, so this is the uh, how this timer operates. So we will use this X timer uh, dot H. Then we will use uh, we what we need to do. If you want to calculate the time of a particular function, we'll start the timer before that function and we'll stop the timer after that function. So what we are going to do, we are going to use the um, uh, two. Uh, uh, we are going to use the uh, two uh, variable. You can see to store the start time and to store the end time. And these are of the type x time. So again, this is defined by the SDK uh, for us, and it will be of the time U64, that is the unsigned 64 bit number. Okay. So you instead of using X time, you can directly define as an integer 64 as well. So it's up to you. But X time looks good. So we'll define the two variables of the time 60 uh, unsigned 64 bit number. Then uh, if you go to the X time dot H, you can see that there are two functions are defined: get time and set time. So this timer is continuously running. So we'll uh, define the get time and the set time. So what we are going to do uh, here, so you can see that uh, we are going to X get time. You can see that we are going to store the value in the uh, value of the counter at this point at in this variable. Then we'll call our two functions, task one, task two, and then we'll uh, load the value of the timer at this point. And difference between this value and this value will help us to uh, get the corresponding value. Now you can see that there is also a, a function called as a X set time. So first thing is to understand how this function works. Now get time is that you need to know the corresponding status of the timer, corresponding value of the timer. So what it is going to do, it is going to read the particular registers in the timer and uh, load the corresponding value. So let's look at what it is doing. So you can see X get time. So reading the global timer register. So you can see that in every IP, there will be a set of register that you will be reading. So you can see that that value which you are reading uh, is being stored in this particular address. There are some additional uh, operations are done, but that you can uh, understand it uh, uh, later. But here you can see that uh, you are getting the, uh, the, 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 the register itself is a 32 bit, a one register. And since your timer is 64 bit, the lower 32 bit are stored in one register, another 32 bits are stored in another register. So you can see that the base address plus upper offset, it is you get the higher one and the lower offset, you get the lower one. So you get the 64 bit data and you combine them together into the one uh, 32 bit, 32 bit, you get combined into the 64 bit and they, you get. So get time is nothing but the you are getting the particular. Uh, status of the uh, current counter because this counter is continuously running so you are getting the corresponding value now similarly there is a set time now in the set time what you are going to do you are going to set the value you can see 64 bit value to be written in the status so you are set the time in the global time so you can set the counter to the known value so what it does it is basically is going to write that value xil out that is it is going to write the value which is the x time uh, global to the particular register. So you can see that the, this is 64 bit, but register is 32 bit. So it is going to update it. And after, uh, before it updates it, it first disable the timer and then it, it's unable that time. Again, what happens, What how you disable the timer? Basically you will write the particular bit in the uh, timer to one or zero. And that uh, when the timer is looking at the start of every clock cycle, the timer will check whether that bit is one or zero. If it is one, that means timer is unable. If it is zero, timer is disabled. So once you uh, write the zero in that, that means timer is disabled. Timer is no longer incrementing. Then you set the timer to, uh, uh, the particular value and then you enable the timer. You can also use this function directly in your code. That is not an issue, but you can see that this is the driver function which is ready-made uh, given to you so that you don't need to write this kind of function every time, right? So your job is uh, uh, gets easier, but at the end, you can see that this is XIL out means it is nothing but the writing it to the particular register and 32 means 32 bits of register. If you go to this function, it is nothing but the you can see that it is just writing the value to the particular register. That's it. Okay, so this is uh, reading and the writing. 
so this is how it happens so let's uh, make use of this one in our uh, code also i have not used it till now but uh, we can use it what we will do is that uh, x times set copy and i'll set it to zero okay so with this i know that i am going to set the timer to zero at the beginning of my time calculation and then uh, now we know that this timer works at the half of the cpu frequency so now i i, I know that uh, this is the start uh, time and this is the end time so i know that the difference with how many count time uh, how much uh, clock cycle has been elapsed between the start and time now if i want to get the time in exactly in seconds so i'll find out the difference between them and i'll divide by the counter frequency so you can see that this is the count per second is another pragma but you can write it in our term you can see that this is the frequency by 2 and since i uh, this uh, this i want this time in the uh, microseconds i am dividing by 10 to the power 6 okay if you want the time in the uh, seconds you don't need to do anything But if you want a time in microseconds, I'm dividing that frequency. Uh, uh, I'm getting uh, getting the uh, time in the uh, uh, I'm getting the time in the uh, microsecond one. So then I'm displaying the corresponding time here. Okay. So that's the only change we have done in the previous code. So now let's execute this code and see whether we are getting the corresponding uh, accurate results or not. so now to get the uh, results uh, i am going to use the my local board in case you are using the uh, remote board please make sure that you modify the bsp and then use the debug configuration appropriately okay so i'll start the terra term uh, since i am using it uh, locally okay so in the terra term i'll select the select port in your case if you are doing the remote hardware you need to use the jtac terminal after you do the debug work i'm using my local hardware so i can use the terra term directly i'll do the setup in the serial port i'll set up the baud rate to 115200 okay this is my terra term here now uh, again in my local one i'll use the run as in case of your case you, if you are using the remote one you should use the debug one so i'll do the run as so my entire code gets executed on the hardware so yeah so you can see that my entire code gets executed and the output is correct and the output gets displayed here in the microsecond that it took 4.46 microsecond for executing this code on the processor that is the ps part so this is how we can uh, take care of the the we can uh, take care of the uh, we can find out the execution time of the processor so what i'll do it i'll do one more step suppose that uh, this is just for the seeing that whether the our code is correct or not i'll calculate the fft just for the sake of increasing the time i'll calculate it one more time okay and uh, let's see what happens okay so let's build the project again and run as launch on hardware so you can see that the time has increased right so that means our code is uh, whatever we are doing timing calculations is actually correct timing calculations okay so okay so but this is functionally not correct so i'll remove the two times 50 okay so this is how we uh, discuss the how to do the execution time calculation on the uh, any application code the process will remain the same irrespective of your uh, which code you are using